I did not expect to enjoy Return nearly as much as I did. So, I have something of a confession to make. I'm sort of over the whole indie game, vaguely dystopian, futuristic, and oftentimes simultaneously depressing aesthetic. I'm not saying it can't or hasn't been done well, but to me at least there are so many games that have come to make use of this theming that it's just gotten a tad old at this point. To me, as someone whose most formative years of gaming came in the late 2000s and early 2010s, it's on par with how in those days every game had a zombie or horde mode in an attempt to copy Call of Duty or Left 4 Dead, or, you know, how every game just tried to be Minecraft, whether by gameplay or presentation. It just reaches a point where it can only work for so long, even if it never becomes bad, so to speak. Yeah, I wasn't terribly interested in Return in light of all that when it first came across my metaphorical desk, but it was on sale and made primarily by two dudes working under the name Dead Unicorn Studios, and I love to support indie developers, and I'm bad with money, and yeah, I bought it. And while I may have expected another stock standard romp through a visual allegory for depression, what I got was actually quite different. Return might be the pinnacle of letting a game breathe, so to speak. Whether it's the story, gameplay, or presentation, it is basically all show and zero tell. It doesn't feel the need to take this tried and true aesthetic and beat you over the head with it. It plainly lets the virtues of its foundation, the very makeup of the game itself, do all the heavy lifting. And that is possible to begin with because... At its core, this is a simplistic game. The story can be summed up as follows. You're on a ship with your family, trying to escape from the dying planet you called home when the systems go haywire, forcing you to awake from cryosleep and return to hell in search of the parts needed to fix the vessel. That's it. The nuggets of story and world building are given in very sparse terms, you often don't learn much about the figures you interact with, the final end goal of some of these actors is never truly explained in most cases, but you can more than surmise just by the reality of the situation you find yourself in and the areas you're shown, that it probably isn't good in all likelihood. The story, initially explained in just a few lines of Star Wars-esque scrolling text, sets up nearly every aspect that follows. The presentation does more than enough to decidedly show why exactly one would want to flee from exactly where you now navigate. Most every area that you explore is a portrait of ruin. Burned out houses, dilapidated factories, and ashen ruins are about as cheery as it gets. The few other survivors you come across are happy to converse, though they, in most cases, are quick to denote how their patience with you can wear thin. The scenes that take place in these areas can be heartbreaking. Images of families destroyed and failed experiments of grandeur are common. Never, not once, does the game tell you exactly why you wouldn't want to return to this doomed planet, nor why you should be so eager to return to your family. It shows you why in nearly each and every image that you see at one point or another. Of course, the most forward example of these facets comes from the enemies that populate most maps. Undead monsters, terrible marauders, and awakened machinations make up the bulk of what you fight against. It isn't bad enough that they're trying to kill you, they also serve as vehicles for the depravity, a depravity which is further exemplified when you take on the associated bosses of every area. This is all accented by an outstanding, atmospheric soundtrack that never steps into the forefront, but does more than enough to finish showing everything that needs to be seen. It's from here that the gameplay and returns take on this theme begin to shake hands. Because the Though this is something of a shorter game, it does want you to take time to explore your surroundings. The final journal entries of people left stranded only add to the feeling of desolation that envelops the very fabric of this game, as do some of the extra goodies that you can find when you really check things out. From a strict gameplay standpoint, uncovering areas that might not be essential lets you find new weapons as well as extra resources with which to better keep yourself alive. There's even a few side quests that, besides coloring the world a bit further, can bring similar rewards. The gameplay itself, in lockstep with the story, is simple to a fault. Much like your favorite Castlevania title, you run from area to area wading through the assortment of enemies I mentioned earlier with nothing more than whatever melee weapons, like a giant sword, which is awesome, 
for the record, and whatever firearms you can scrounge together. Your only real defensive maneuver is a tactical role, and defeating enemies grants you experience points, which can be used to upgrade the weapons you either find or purchase from the vendors located in the wastelands. Again, it's not super in-depth or detailed, but it's more than enough for the way that it leaves you room to appreciate everything else about the game. And it's undoubtedly helped by the way that it really threads that fine line between difficulty and forgiveness. So, you're going to die in this game. Probably a lot, if we're honest. The enemies can be as punishing as they are ugly, a fact which is only doubly true for the numerous bosses, with several instant death attacks rearing their head, and general surprise from one area to another being a constant. That means you've got to use some trial and error to learn the attack patterns and speeds that this all plays out at. Also, basically every boss has multiple stages, so just be prepared for that. But this is fine because when you die, the game just sends you back to just before the start of whatever room you met your demise in. Not the beginning of the entire level, mind you, just the room itself. You don't lose any resources and are free to try again as need be. Might seem like that would make it too easy, until you learn that your health does not replenish in the same manner. Whatever your health when you first enter a room, that's all you've got to play with. As you can imagine, if you find yourself in a situation where you're low on health and lacking healing potions, you're gonna have to learn to basically perfect a room in order to get through. And don't think you can just pop back to town either. You can only fast travel between places at specific checkpoints, and enemies respawn in a lot of situations, meaning you can't even run all the way back if you really wanted to. Make sure you're prepared before you embark, take your time, and you'll be fine, even if it will almost certainly get tougher the further you go. Thankfully, there's usually a healing station before bosses, and you can unlock some passive skills that aid in your defense throughout the adventure. This sort of format really does make progression feel fulfilling. This is particularly true for the bosses. Some of them can be really tough, especially this bastard. Oh my god, this one broke my back for a solid 30 minutes. But damn, if it doesn't feel good when you finally learn enough to make some headway. As if it needs to be said, as you've seen throughout this review, the game looks stupendous. A nice, minimalistic implementation of pixel art that still manages to use a wide assortment of colors, mainly helpful for differentiating areas between one another. I do think it could do with a bit more definition in certain places. For instance, due to the fact that many of the enemies are largely dark colored, that means they can wind up blending into the background in certain situations, making them hard to see. Additionally, while I think the soundtrack fits the world well, there is a chance that some might find it a touch empty. There's a lot of droning in some of the tracks, if you get what I mean. I dig it, but I would understand if certain players are left yearning for more tracks like those that accompany the boss battles, which are a bit more active overall. What is unequivocally awesome by comparison is the material in the art book. Get your hands on this if you can afford the bundle. It provides great background and context for what you see in-game. Of course, I would only do so if you're so comfortable with the game's somewhat steep $18 price tag. It's... A little short, it's only about three hours long, it's probably overpriced by a couple of bucks if we're being completely honest, but it does have a new game plus feature and some achievement hunting that can stretch the experience a bit if you're so inclined. At the end, when I finally repaired my ship and blasted off to reunite with my family, I was sad that the game was over. It's always nice to be pleasantly surprised with a game that you might not have had the highest expectations of going into but I can safely say that I really enjoyed Return. It kind of feels like it embodies a lot of what makes indie games great. It isn't overproduced, it has a cool theme, and knows precisely what it is. It's a great effort, and Dead Unicorn has already started work on their next title, Blood Running. I'm looking forward to that, and if you get the chance to try Return, I have a sneaking suspicion you will as well.